All right, welcome into another episode of the Ryan and Goodman podcast. I'm Jeff Goodman. He is none other than Robert Ryan, and we have uh, a special guest on today. We have Milwaukee Bucks general manager John Horst uh, down in Orlando. It's not doesn't look that sunny behind you, John. It looks like maybe you got one of those Orlando downpours. Yeah, we did. I was I was ready to do this with you guys outside in the beautiful sun, but now we're inside. Yeah, a little <laughs> rain going on. Still got to be better than uh, Milwaukee or Boston. So a very I, I simple question. Very simple question, John. What's new? What's <laughs> new? <laughs> I mean, I was kidding. The, the the state of affairs. I mean, how have you, you guys and you and all your your colleagues and your contemporaries, uh, you know, adjusted to this reality of the craziness that you don't know what's going to happen day to day, right? Yeah, you don't know. It's it's incredible. Like there's there's so much that goes into just getting on the floor to have a game. Um, you know, last night we had a game, we played the Orlando Magic. There was fans in the seats. There was fans um, not overly far from the floor. That was a new experience for us. And most of our games have been without fans. So that's that's something that's new. Uh, but the NBA is incredible. Uh, their ability to pivot and adjust and continue to stay on this and put us in a position to play and play safe and healthy has, has been great. And we'll just keep moving forward and being ready and being being flexible. All right, let, let's go back, John. Let's go back. You're, you're a young, you're a young guy, so we don't have to go back that far. But we're going to go back to your days, uh, Rochester College. You're a Michigan guy, and uh, I'm told you were the superintendent of a trailer park uh, back when you were in college. Is this true? What 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 did that entail? This is true. I don't superintendent. Like maybe that sounds really official. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was the head maintenance and uh, kind of manager of, of a property, a trailer park property, um, maybe 20 minutes from my college in Rochester that really got me through college. The, my first year, my first summer after my freshman year, all the way through college, worked a ton of hours um, from the entire summer, gave me an ability to, to stay in Rochester and continue to play with the team in the off season and make some extra money and enough money to get through each year the, the following year. Uh, learned a lot of lessons, but yeah, uh, Woodland Hills Trailer Park in Rochester, Michigan, uh, was a place of employment for almost four years. What, what was the worst thing you had to do at the tra- I don't that know, trailer? I don't park. know if it's appropriate for a podcast in public. It was pretty bad. <laughs> All right, I, I listen. I can only imagine. We don't have to yeah. go through it, but I can visualize what you had to do. So you couldn't come up with a booster with a good no-show job, huh? You know, I don't know that boosters exist at Rochester College, Bob. I have to tell you, like, it's an <laughs> unbelievable education, great basketball environment. I don't know if we really had boosters. Yeah, you, you, we could have used one of those good no-show <laughs> jobs somewhere, you know? Yeah. Now, tell me, when you're 20 years old, 21, what, are you, what, what were you projecting? What were you thinking about you know, where you might be 10 years down the road? Yeah, it's so not too dissimilar from what I'm doing, believe it or not, in, in that uh, I've always wanted to be involved in basketball. Uh, my dad coached. I played from a really young age love the sport, uh, what I thought I was going to do. And the reason I frankly chose Rochester College, really successful uh, small college program, close in proximity to the Detroit Pistons, uh, then in Auburn Hills, is I wanted to coach. Uh, I wanted to figure out a way to take my college playing career, which I knew would end at some point and, and not go beyond college and coach basketball. And uh, so at 20 or 21, I, that was still a dream. You know, probably 21, 22, 23 transitioned um, into a front office because I learned about the front office, you know, doing an internship with the Pistons and studying from John Hammond and Joe Dumars and Scott Perry and Jeff Weltman, some of these people that I got to work with early in my career in Detroit, uh, really learned about what a front office was and the, the challenges of that and got excited about that. But before that it was really a goal to coach and, and to coach at the highest level I could. Well, you, you were so, I mean, you know, you're, you're 37. So, uh, when they won those two back to backs in '89 and '90, were you how aware were you as a, a young lad? Yeah, a, a diehard basketball fan, Isaiah Thomas, Rick Mahorn, uh, Joe Dumars, obviously, you know, John, Bill Bill Lambeer. Yeah, Bill Lambeer, all, the whole crew. And, and for me to uh, have my first initial mentor and person who I worked from and learned from be Joe Dumars, my connectivity to that group who I was you know seven eight nine year old kid that that loved those teams and di- lived and died by those teams um to be able to in my 20s and now 30s still have connections to guys like Isaiah and, and you know former Chuck Daly and, and Bill and I and just you know Rick Mahorn I played pickup basketball with Rick Mahorn many times and just different things like that has been a dream come true and you live to tell the tale 
Yeah, although I, if anyone asks, you know, the hardest you've ever been hit in a screen, it's undoubtedly Rick Mahorn has laid me out with screens like you've never felt anything like it. You've seen oh, I, it, you've witnessed oh, it many a times. I can believe it. I believe me, I, I'm well, well versed in the lore <laughs> of, of Rick Mahorn. Just God, I got the scouting report on you as a player. Oh, boy, I can't wait to hear that. <laughs> Plays hard as hell. Um, shooting a little suspect. I think that that's being kind of streaky right? is a positive version of that streaky shooter. Yeah. Streaky shooter. All right. We'll, we'll give you streaky shooter. Yeah. No problem. Um, what, give me kind of, again, your road was Detroit. You, you go uh, to the bucks, John Hammond, you're the director of basketball operations in, in, in 2017. Um, describe to me what the, when I think of it from a college perspective, I'm like, all right, that's the guy who, for the, the, the Dobo in college sets a schedule, some of those things. What were you doing um, before you got the GM job? Because you had a different path. Yeah, I think, you know, the Dobo in college basketball in uh, NBA is actually a very different role, which is an interesting thing. Very obviously exact titles. Um, and, and, and of course, it's different in every team, too. So in my role uh, with the Detroit Pistons and then with the Milwaukee Bucks in that role, it was a lot of cap, uh, salary cap, a lot of strategy, a lot of contract execution. Um, John, uh, first starting Joe in Detroit and then John in Milwaukee gave me an incredible runway to work on things and, and deal with agents and deal with other teams and help negotiate, you know, finer points of deals at the end, um, work on trades, different things. And so there was a lot of personnel, a lot of transactional uh, roster uh, things, but there was also the traditional kind of assumed role of Adobo of, scheduling and logistics and and being a liaison between the league and um, dealing with different HR issues with staff and so the role for me more than the title uh, that John allowed me to have first Joe and then John allowed me to have I got exposure and access to everything that goes on and so it was really like maybe a great total our title could have been junior general manager I mean I was really being able to generally manage every single day and learn from I think the best. Uh, you just got the job done with Giannis, uh, much to the delight of Milwaukee uh, citizenry. Um, did, were you always confident that it would get done or did he leave you with a little, eh, you know, worries at times about whether he would consent to taking the 200 plus million dollars from you guys? <laughs> yeah, we, we got the job done and uh, I'll, all honesty, yeah, never, ever comfortable or I would say confident, yes, never comfortable until it was done. It's a zero, it's a zero sum game. It's either 100% yes or it's a no. And until you get the name on the paper and, and <laughs> get the signature on the line, uh, I don't know that you have any relief or any real confidence. But I believe and still believe in, in the organization that we have, the way that we've treated him and his family, uh, the environment he gets to come to every day and work. Coach Bud has done an incredible job. We, he has great teammates. We've had a lot of success. You know, we haven't done the ultimate. We haven't won a championship yet, uh, but we've had a great level of success over the last couple of years. It gets better and better every year. And I had a lot of confidence in that, but man, are you nervous? That's, that's a massive thing for a city, for a state, for a franchise, for an individual and in, in role. So it's massive. So never, never comfortable. You know, I mean, if you hadn't gotten it done, what can you imagine what this season would have been like? Uh, you know, with that being the I would be in hiding. John would be in hiding. Right right. Right. Almost the second, the second narrative, you know, narrative that it would have been. Uh, so it, there must have been an immense sigh of relief, among, yeah. uh, among other things. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Did you feel a ton of pressure, John? Like, was it sleepless nights? I mean, what, what, what was it like for you personally? Yeah. Yes. A ton of pressure. Um, and I, there's always pressure in any of these jobs. And so I'm, I'm accustomed to that. I, I think it's one of the things that uh, I've been able to do well. And, and you do it because you have incredible support. I have a great staff, um, you know, again, a great partner in Coach Bud and Peter Fagan, our team president. So you pressure is part of this and you deal with it in certain ways. But it'd be lying if I said that I've ever felt any pressure um, like that that's it, it, again it's a massive thing for the franchise for the organization and I, I don't say this lightly and I say it humbly it for our league it, it for Giannis to commit to the Milwaukee Bucks into our franchise it, it's proof that you can do it in a smaller market you can do it by doing things the right way um, and it's proof I think of the quality and the character of the players in our league 
at the end of the day, Giannis had to make a decision. We could do everything that we could possibly do to put us in a position to have success and to have him, but he had to make the decision. His family had to make the decision and it, it speaks to the character of who he is. And, and I think it's, it's really a positive for the entire league. John, the uh, league scoring is way up. Uh, there have been at least two games I know of in which each team scored 140 without uh, overtime. And I'm, 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 you know, and I lived through a period of time, we all did that when it was an ice age, 30, I, I was just telling Jeff, I, I came across a stat, your Pistons back in the 90, 99, once went, held teams to under 138 straight games. Now you can't imagine that in this day's day and age. All right, what's going on? There's a theory that nobody wants to guard anybody because of COVID. I don't buy that one, but I'm serious. You know, it's out there. Uh, uh, what what is, is it a talk among the league and uh, uh, about this you know uptick in scoring and 130 is routine? So I'll answer your question, but because I'm like a historian and kind of a stat nut, is that was that the Larry Brown teams? Was that early 2000s that did that? I got to double check. I, I think it was uh, back in the in the you know in the Chuck days. But Larry, okay. I'm glad you brought up Larry because yeah. people don't realize they think of him in a certain way. And they don't realize that he was one of the main architects of, 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 of the defensive. He incredible of, defensive coach. Shots, shots per game. I charted shots per game over the years. You know, it used yeah. to be in his fifties and sixties. You had to take a hundred shots to game. They thought they, yeah. and then it started dropping gradually. And, and finally a Jerry Sloan team became the first one to us uh, take under 80 shots a game. And then Larry made it an art form. No one realizes that Larry was a defensive ogre. <laughs> a genius I mean absolutely so I, I think that's a fun stat because I his teams absolutely had a run like that I think um I think the way the, the shots that players practice the things that they practice offensively the defenses have given the worst shots you know historically and and players are getting better at making the worst shots they're, they're making deep threes they're making they're getting back into the mid-range they're making the floaters um, there's just really, really gifted talent that I think is, is increasing the offensive um, kind of output. I also think the indirect, I do think fanless basketball right now, I think um, reduced travel, uh, you know, in the bubble when we played in Orlando, I just think some of the environmental factors actually um, are conducive to better offensive output. And, and I think like short turnarounds, Bob, we had a shorter, we had a, a shortened training camp. We had a shortened preseason and defense is hard. Defense is, is tactical. It's, it's a, you know, it's a game of inches. And I think until you really get tuned in and, and really focused in on the right details in defense, that's going to struggle. I, I, all that being said, I think it'll come back. And, and I think there is some great defensive teams and great defensive performers, obviously Giannis being defensive player of the year, one of them. I think that as the season progresses, I, I don't think that we'll have, you know, 130, 140 point scoring averages to top our league, but shoot, you had the Dallas Mavericks last year, the best offensive team in the NBA put up a ton of points right now. We're one or two, I think in the league offensively, we're scoring a ton of points. I think that'll, I think it'll kind of regress back to the normal. We all know the playoffs traditionally will, you know, have a different brand of basketball yep. yeah. and all that. And I, I know it will come down, but yeah. Still, this is a start. These are startling numbers compared to what we're, you know, we, we, we once saw. Uh, I, I was kidding, Jeff. I said, this is like, I grew up with the Eastern League. It's just like the Eastern League in 1964, you know, uh, Hazleton versus the uh, Allentown Jets, you know. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting. And it's interesting. Yeah. John, all the moves you made, you know, getting Drew, um, Portis, uh, DJ, we signed it, our boy, and we'll get to Conanton down the road. We we, we got to spend a few minutes on Conanton. That's my guy. We got um, a Boston crew here. We got to talk about Pat, right? That's right. That's right. So, how much did that impact Giannis? Those guys. I mean, I, I thought the, the Drew trade was phenomenal. I think everybody did across the league. Um, but how much did that, in its totality, do you think convince Giannis to stay? Because you guys were were, were making moves that you could fight for a title. I think it mattered. Yeah, I think I think it helped. I think it mattered. Again, you go back to the foundation that had been built and so much that was in place with with starting with the ownership and, and the way that they've invested in the team and Coach Bud and his staff and the success that we had. I think those things played a major part, of course. But Giannis, like all of us, has an expectation to, to get better every single day, to improve the team, to not kind of rest and settle on on past successes, but to push the envelope. And that's what those transactions were for us as a front office staff. That's, that's one of my roles with this organization 
is to not rest on what we've done and just be satisfied with that, but to continue to push and, and try to get better and improve. And, and we've had a really good team. We've had the best regular season record the last two years. We've done historic things offensively and defensively. We had a conference finals run two years ago. We had a shortened season in, in, the, in the bubble last year, but we've had a lot of success but that's not good enough. And, and whether they work or not, Jeff, I, I don't know, but the idea behind it was to, to make the team as best that we could and to make the right moves to try to continue to improve. And I don't think that we did that because we were trying to convince Giannis to stay. We did that because it's our job. Our job is to continue to get better and to put him in the best position to win every single day. And starting with Drew, who's been great so far, and Bobby Portis and Bryn and, and Torrey Craig and DJ Augustine, Pat, bringing Pat back, um, our draft picks, all those things were really intentional tactical moves to try to make this team better than it's been in the past. Jeff, uh, Jeff excuse me, John, what are, what is scouting like now in COVID? Uh, both the uh, advanced scouting of the league and I'm, I'm more interested actually in college scouting and, 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 and international scouting that was such an important part of the league. How, uh, what's happening? How do people handle this situation right now? Yeah, I'm sure it's different across the board. I can tell you for us, it's it's become very remote. Obviously, there's a lot more video work. We were already transitioning and pushing that way anyways um, to be more video based. But there's a lot of that. We have five consultants uh, kind of across the globe that have been established the last three or four years. For us, that's been a great benefit because there's not really an access point for uh, domestic scouts to go international right now. It's not safe. It's, I, I would never let our guys do that. But the fact that we have uh, scouts, you know, in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, in South America, uh, we have a connected point there, which has been great for us. So we have someone that we can connect to and can actually work. So we've been able to do well, I think, internationally over this time period. A few of my uh, scouts are, if they're comfortable, they're, they're on, in the cars and they're driving to games that they can go to. And if they're not comfortable for their own personal reasons, then I'm not making them do it. You know, we're we're just doing the best that we can in the midst of all of this. In some ways, I think, Bob, I think it'll change. I think it'll change the league's approach to scouting because I think we're all going to learn that we can do the job and do it really, really well with not having as much time in person on the road as what we're used to. I think it's still very important. We have to, you have to be in the gym. You have to feel the, feel the game. You have to see the talent up close. You have to talk to the coaches. You have to build those relationships but I don't know that you need to do that 25 or 30 times for each prospect like we have in the past. You might be able to do that five or 10 times and you might be able to supplement it with meetings and video work and stat dives and things like that. So it's, it was already trending that way. In my opinion, for sure. It was in our organization. I think it'll have a lasting impact on the league. Yeah. I, I think love a lot of the money, uh, you know, listen to me, like you said, there's a lot of money that's spent <laughs> over the years traveling and seeing guys that was honestly unnecessary. You know, so I, I do think, but this year it's going to be hard because a lot of a lot of guys aren't laying eyes on on these guys at all in person. So, do you feel like there'll be a lot more mistakes made in next year's draft than than there have been? It's interesting. You know, it's going to be a great study for a two, hopefully a two year period. You know, last year I did I didn't feel at all inadequate uh, at the draft. I thought we were beyond covered. We had more time than we ever had. We had done a ton of video work, but we had that base foundation of seeing these guys in person and live up until um, the pandemic hit, really, until the hiatus ha happened. And so you had that foundation. Now we're starting a new scouting season without that foundation. If we end with that, right, if, you're, if we end with it, we'll be really in live and doing live scouting, I think we'll feel the same. If we don't end with that, it'll be a whole nother phase, right? So we'll have went from one phase to the second into the third. And so I can't really predict you know, exactly what that'll feel like or if mistakes will be made. I, I just think we'll continue to do the best that we can with kind of the parameters that are there and, and try to make the best decisions. But I can tell you this past draft, I felt great. Well, again, who knows if it works or not. I felt great. Through March, but you did yeah. get all, you got the entire college basketball. Season really yeah, with the big foundation. I don't know if we'll have that or not. It's, it's interesting to I see how we will play out. I mean, I'd be shocked yeah. if, you know, again, like you said, you can go to certain places like I can. I did like four days at Mohegan Sun. Yeah. I haven't been to a game since. If I want to go to a BC game, I can, but I can't go to Providence or Rhode Island. So yeah. I don't know how many, how many college games have you been to this year in person? Yeah, so me zero because the way that the parameters are, the league's protocols are set up, which rightfully so, it's almost impossible. You kind of have to choose. You have to be with your team um, as an executive or you can scout. 
So I personally been to zero, you know, my, my scouts, like I said earlier, my scouts have been to a handful of games. We're in a great for scouting basketball in, uh, from a car ride to be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin is great. I mean, we can get to Iowa, we can get to Illinois, we can get to, you know, uh, Madison, like all these different areas. So we've had a good opportunity, but I don't know. I don't know when the first time is I'll go watch a college game live. John, uh, this is going to be the 50th anniversary of the Milwaukee Bucks one championship. Uh, and are there, are there any plans to commemorate or would you rather not call attention to the fact that there's only been one in the, in the franchise's history? <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, you know, Peter Fagan can answer the question better about the plans, but I can tell you, like, we're proud of our history. So not every franchise can, can even host one um, and, and hold up one. So I, I think we, we're proud of our history. We, we educate our players on the history, our staff on the history of the franchise. Um, but by no means do we, we focus a lot of time on looking back. We're pretty excited and looking forward and what, we, you know, setting new history standards, but no, we're proud. We're proud of the championship. And for me, it's fun. I, I uh, one of the best things about this job is the people that you get access to and that you get to learn and spend time with. And John McLaughlin, someone who I've spent a ton of time with was a major part of that, that championship team. And, and obviously our Bucks history and to be able to have different, you know, interactions with Kareem or Oscar over the years, just to be able to spend time with the guys that were part of those groups and, and actually know them. And then to like, you know, commemorate those moments. It's pretty cool to, to have that access. Just so you give your, your, your uh, team some, something to shoot for that team shot 51% from the floor as a team and, and had a 12 point plus, uh, margin of, you know, uh, plus 12 per game, uh, 118 points a game to 106. So, uh, and the other thing is, I thought this is how the world's changed. The starting forwards were six six and six five. <laughs> Bobby Dandridge and Greg Smith. You said the starting point guards or starting forwards? The, no, the forwards. The point guard was Oscar. <laughs> the point guard was Oscar at six five, and McLaughlin was six five also. Yeah. So you had you put you know, Lou Alcindor was the center, by the way. Yeah. Not Kareem Abdul Jabbar, <laughs> and you put uh, they put five four six fives around him, and it worked out pretty well because he went to thirty one and sixteen that year. <laughs> on route to his MVP. I, I yeah. learned something on this pod every week, John. Every <laughs> single week, I learned uh, plenty uh, from before. Uh, you were definitely born, and, and a lot of times before I was born as well. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's get to our boy from Boston, Pat Conant. Um, <laughs> can, can he play? Can we let him play baseball and hoop at the same time? Like, have you seen him throw? You know, can he still hit 95? What, what do we think? Is he going to give baseball a try, or is this? Full, you know, full hoops. Uh, Pat, I think you'd have to ask him, but I, my, uh, Pat and I are very close. We spent a lot of time together. He's full hoops. He, he's a junkie. He loves hoops. There's a reason why someone who's as good or was as good at baseball as he is and was uh, plays in the NBA because he loves, loves hoops. And he's really good at it. I always, I always joke with him, don't forget you're a great basketball player, not just a shooter. You're not just an athlete. Like you're a basketball player. And uh, he, I think, you know, <laughs> He's talented enough and gifted enough, as you guys know, that maybe when he's done with basketball, who knows what he'll try next. I mean, he's into his real estate and he's 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 a very dynamic, uh, impressive young man. And uh, so thankful that we were able to get him a couple of years ago. Keep him now. Um, I've seen him throw his fastball. I, I don't know if it's still 95, but he's still got heat. He did. a He threw the opening pitch at a Brewers game maybe a year or two ago and it wasn't maybe the most accurate throw, you know, and he can laugh about that, but it had a lot of heat. I can tell you that. <laughs> What's your best Conanton story? I mean, I, I always tell people like the one thing with Pat, um, he's so mature and, and he's so honest, but he doesn't offend people. And, and that's a gift, right? Like that's hard to do. I'm honest. I offend people like that. That's just the way I am. <laughs> Pat, he's, he's somehow, everybody likes Pat, even though there's no BS with Pat. Yeah, I've got a lot of great stories and I'll, I'll share the best one, I guess, and, and at risk of um, probably getting myself in trouble or for sure him in trouble, but it was it was a non-incident, so we're good. So this is maybe a month or two into, uh, after us signing him, we're in LA, uh, we're playing the Lakers and the Clippers and we're staying in Santa Monica. And um, I just say, hey, Pat, you wanna go out and have dinner? He's like, I'd love to have dinner. So we, we went to a steakhouse and he and, and I and Dave Dean, who works with me, we had a great dinner. And we're walking back to the hotel after dinner and there's these, the birds, the limes, the, the little scooter things. He's like, man, you guys ever ride these? I'm like, no, Pat, I've never rode these. He's like, let's go. 
And I'm thinking in my mind, I just signed a contract. I'm pretty sure there's a, a, a place in the contract that says we're not supposed to ride things. And you and I signed it. We're literally the two people that signed it. But sure enough, like he and I jump on the birds and we're riding the birds like kind of around Santa Monica. And so my first kind of lime scooter experience and, and maybe my last was with Pat Connaughton. By for sure, neither of us were supposed to be riding them. <laughs> I, I love the way you very casually and accurately describe the dispersal of your scouts across the globe. You didn't mention Antarctica, by the way, but I mean, I mean but with, I am fascinated by the globalization of the league. I, 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 I love to point out to people, and this is a funny little subplot, that the first European who came into the league without American background at all, no high school, no college, was a guy named Georgi Guchkov, sure. who the Suns had in 84, 85. And he was a Bulgarian. There's never been another Bulgarian. I, 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 he, he was the first, anyway. Can you imagine? I'm right, what we digress. Can you imagine the league without the hundred plus international players and and the idea that basketball is as not would not you know be an international game? I mean, this is all you've known for the most part, right? I can't. I can't imagine it. And and as Jeff said, I, I've just learned something new too. And the fact that it was eighty four, eighty five, I was alive. So I, shame on me for not having that stat. But no, I I think. Man, I can't imagine. I don't, and I, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right. And I imagine that this was David Stearns and now Adam Silver's vision and plan. Um, our league is so globalized. It's for someone like me, who's fortunate enough to be able to travel around the world to, to scout talent and to, to be in different places and to see the passion uh, in different countries for the NBA, for Giannis, for, you know, Luca, for all these players that have, have transformed are currently transforming our league and spreading you know, Kobe, you know, in Asia and just the different things that have happened. It's the passion for the NBA across the globe is massive. And I cannot imagine a league that's not represented by the international players that we have. And it's so much. The other thing I would say about, like, I think it's transformed the quality of the basketball. I, I, the, like the M NBA basketball is really, really quality. In my opinion, it's very fundamental. The guys play hard. They play with IQ. They play together. It's a team game. I think it's a really high quality um, product that we have. And I think the international impact is, is massive in that. Where would we be without the Eurostep? <laughs> Very <laughs> you true. Know, have you have, in your travels, have you been to Lithuania? I have. Okay. I have oh, I, I, just give me something there. I'll have to, because you know, it's the Indiana of, of, you know, they, right, the Indiana of, Basque, of, of Europe, supposedly. And, 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 you know, I think we, we were talking earlier about the, the impetus where it came from. That well, that Olympic victory in in eighty eight was not Soviet Union. That was the Lithuanian All Stars, and you know, Marcelonis, Sabonis, etc. And I think that was where people said, "My God, there's really good players out there. We better start checking them out." Anyway, have you tell me about Lithuania? Anything you can tell us? I'll give you like a basketball nugget, and I'll give you a non basketball nugget. So. Lithuania, what I remember about scouting the games there, um, I was, I've only been in Lithuania maybe three or four days in total, but probably two different trips. The, they have incredibly hard playing, uh, tough physical guards. And if you're a big, which a lot of our uh, NBA players that have come from Lithuania are your 6'11", your seven, like the bigger guys, you stand out amongst the rest of the population. And so it's, it's like if you go to scout a game, the majority of the Lithuanian player are these really hard playing kind of undersized physical guys. And then these guards are kind of standing like, you know, a tree amongst, you know, shrubs basically that are out there and you just watch these guys shooting the jump hooks and their skills and whatever. It's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty unique environment. It's not like that in every country, the other countries, it's more similar to like what you would see in a basketball product here, but in Lithuania, I would, that's one of the things that stands out. Um, the, the non-basketball, in their arenas, in their concession stands, uh, the ones that I've been to, they sell beer, they sell cigarettes, and they sell these like what I would call like big croutons that you dip in mayonnaise that are the most unhealthy but best kind of <laughs> little snack that you could ever get in an arena. And like, that's it. You can't really get anything else. You can get, you can get a drink and you can get these croutons dipped in mayonnaise <laughs> so do we have smoke filled arenas like the old madison square garden is that what no you about? have uh smoking sections outside of the arenas oh, yeah oh, okay i haven't been there's still some places where you can get smoke filled arenas in europe absolutely but not lithuania i can tell you i i was at the old garden 48th and and, and 8th and and you know i remember those smoke filled arena days <laughs> john you know i was in lithuania for 10 days oh wow 
So did you have the croutons? I did not have the croutons. I had the, the double hot dog. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't. The double hot dog. Um, my, my favorite story, I'm, I'm not going to get into why I was in Lithuania. If you remember back, you can recall why I got sent to Lithuania for ESPN um, for a certain father and two sons. Um, but I, I was over there, with Jimmy Barron. I don't know if you remember that name. Jimmy Barron was over there. And I had known him since he was about 15 years old. He was playing for, uh, for a team over there in, in Connors. And he said he never went out, you know, father, um, young, uh, young daughter. So I'm like, come on, we got to go out. Like I'm in Lithuania. I haven't seen you in years. We got to go out. So we go out and we meet one of his teammates and they're not supposed to go out, I guess. So we meet one of his teammates and we get escorted to the back room. And it's exactly what you would think when you think of like a Lithuanian, like club back room. And I'm, I'm not a big drinker. Like if I'm a drink, I'm gonna have a beer, a couple beers, whatever. And this dude is like, all right, you're drinking. Like, I'm like, all right, I'll have like, you know, one vodka. No, no, bottles upon <laughs> bottles of vodka and tequila. I'm like, no, I can't hang with you. He, he's 6'9", 260, your typical Lithuanian. You know, they, they just start sending stuff back. I'm like, Jimmy, we, we got to leave. Like, I, there's no way I can hang with this dude. Um, but yeah, it was, the country is amazing, Bob. It really, I mean, their passion yeah. for basketball, the people there are super like I love the experience to to see that I didn't love why I went but I love being in Lithuania and seeing that country and the people and their passion for basketball it was it was a basketball country they have incredible arenas like a lot of their arenas are brand new so you talk about like the smoke the, it's not that they have these brand new built I would say kind of state-of-the-art arenas um you know, they might not hold 20,000 people. They might hold, you know, 10 or 15, but I mean, they have really, really nice basketball facilities you know, there. Uh, uh, the phrase punching above your weight comes to mind. I remember, you remember that in 2000, they almost beat the U.S. And and almost, and it came down to the last shot in, in, um, in, in uh, Melbourne, in Sydney. And Donnie Nelson was at still in his, associated with them at the time. And I was sitting with him afterward. And he said, I can't do this anymore, you know, because it's, it's, yeah, it's just too, I'm too torn now, too emotional. But he explained why he said they're the most like us, the way they play. That's why they're the ones, you know, they're, they play the most. This, now, this is 30, uh, 20 years ago, but right. they're, they're 21. They said they're the most like us, you know. And, uh, but you know, I don't know if you, you, where you, I'm sure you know, John, that Donnie was very associated with them. He was, you know, and, and, uh, but he, I remember I'm sitting with him and he goes, I, I, Bob, I can't do it anymore. You know, yeah, and they, they've gotten too good now, you know, <laughs> you know, so it's one thing they helped them climb the ladder, you know, the little right. team they could suddenly they almost beat the U.S. Wait a minute. I'm going to be coaching a team that's going to beat the U.S. I don't think so. That wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> hey, John, I've, I've met Giannis a couple of times and uh, blown away. And, and again, I've talked to Pat enough about him. So I know what he's about, the fabric of Giannis and nobody. You never hear a bad word about him. Um like, what does he do for your organization to have a star that is that conducts himself that way that doesn't appear, you know, you always talk about, like, everybody's got an ego. I always say Steph Curry's the one guy to me that, like, hasn't changed since I met him at Davidson or even before that. He has not changed. Most, most stars change. Has Giannis changed? I, I, yeah. And I would say like, every, like you said, everyone changes. You know, I, I think I've changed, you've changed Giannis. I would argue that Steph has changed. I think everyone changes. It's just like the, the impl what's implied there when people ask that question is have they changed for the worse, you know, or are they more of an ego or are they, you know, separate themselves. And I would say absolutely not. Has Giannis changed for the better? I'd say absolutely. And he, the ways that he has grown um, on the court is obvious. You can all see it. We can, we can chronicle it. We can go look at it off the court as a teammate, um, as a father now, um, as a brother, as a partner and a friend with me and, and just, just every level, you know, as, as a business person, um, his maturity and growth from someone who I met, you know, his first day in the, in the U S after we drafted him to where he is now today is amazing. And it's a credit, I think to his focus, to his, to his ethos, to who he is, the, the culture and character of, of, of where he's grown from and who he is. Um, and hopefully, you know, Milwaukee and our organization and the people around him have played a role in, in helping him grow and his teammates grow and will continue to do so. But 
he's absolutely changed, but in my opinion, in all the right ways and all the good ways. And I think that's what you want out of any player or any person that you work with. Um, but to have that be in the package of a superstar, the best player in the world, uh, who's now 26 years old and has this incredible runway uh, to continue to grow and evolve and develop, um, the foundation that he's shown and the way that he's gonna grow and the way that he's gonna change is pretty encouraging. <laughs> Last one I have for you is it's just about kind of where we're at right now. We started that way with, with Bob asking about how crazy it is for you. What 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 do you think should be done? Like what would I know you don't want to tell Adam Silver how to how to run his job. I'm not Never. asking you to do that. Never. Yes, I know you got to be careful there. But, you know, is it we've seen games be canceled and postponed here in the last few days. Is it expanding the rosters? Is it making sure that everybody's wearing masks? Is it making sure that they're not going out for dinners? What are the things, because I've, I've seen this in college, right? Like life has gone on, not perfect, but you've got a lot more, uh, a lot more teams, right? A lot. So if you've got, right now you got 40 teams that are playing in college. Well, you've still got another 300. It's not as big a deal. But if you have five teams that aren't playing in the NBA, well, that means you've got those five teams aren't playing five others. Right. You've only got, you know, a, a, a small amount. Um, so I guess my biggest question to you is what do you think can be done to try and make sure that this season runs? It, there's going to be hiccups. We know that. Yeah, I, I think um, you mentioned a lot of the things I, I would tell you to speak a little bit above that. And, and more generally, I think what should be done is being done. And I started by answering the credit to the NBA and I'll go back to it. And it's what's, what's being done is that we constantly meet and talk and discuss and figure out how to pivot and take the next step. And you do everything that you possibly can with rules and protocol and compliance to position, position yourself as best as possible for the moment. And then something happens and you have to be able to adjust. And the league has been amazing. I, I think, you know, collectively as general managers, collectively as team presidents, um, there's a lot of brain power. There's a lot of great ideas and thoughts and in the league to their credit has really dove in with us and they're listening to us and we're adjusting. We're trying to figure it out together and, you know, uh, increasing roster size and mask wearing and social distancing and all, all the things, all the kind of hot button key keywords and topics that you're hearing about and reading about and thinking about are the same things that we talk about, but we're trying to apply it and you try to apply it in a way we can't just continue to play games and play games at a rapid pace without also considering the ramifications of the body. Like COVID is a major factor and we have to adjust for COVID, but so is the health of the players with soft tissue and injuries and, and, you know, fatigue and the quality of the product. And so it's a massive undertaking uh, that I think we are best suited uh, of any league because of the leadership that we have with Adam and his staff and the way that they collaborate with us and try to figure out, um, a best best resolution we'll see i mean it's we're early in it but i think so far we've had a few cancellations sure but i think we've had a lot of success and we're we're on the right path perfect well listen uh we appreciate you joining us i know bob does yeah very uh, enjoyable too you, you, yeah you thank you guys my pleasure now john that you <laughs> brought bob ryan's podcast it, it is on the bucket list i i, I really appreciate it thank you guys it's awesome uh, likewise uh be good be safe and uh hopefully uh get out of that rain